and I'm going to present the next next speaker that is Stefan Heckman from the Leibniz Institute of Plant Genetics and Crop Plant Research. Uh, and uh, he will uh, present, uh, uh, we will now shift to a different topics on plants and he will present a single haploid nucleus genotyping in barley measuring meiotic recombination rates in pollen nuclei. And uh, he, he was invited as a guest of uh, our Stila sponsor in the meeting. Thank you very much. You can start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Pamela, for the introduction. I hope everybody can hear me. And um, yeah, yes. I would also like to thank um, Stilla for uh, inviting me or asking today to tell you a little bit about plants and um, basically our application using the Stilla, the NICAR system, so the Crystal Digital PCR machine. And what I would like today to present here is actually work of uh, a very talented PhD student who recently finished. This is Jun Jayan, then also of Zuria Muta, who is currently a PhD student to follow up the project, and also of Jörg Fuchs, who is very key for the flow cytometer analysis. And as the name already said, we use a crystal digital PCR to genotype single haploid nuclei. Um, as the name of the research groups already says, our group is interested or my team is interested in meiosis because meiosis is a key event for sexual reproduction. And basically, um, just to remind, meiosis is characterized by two chromosome segregation around that follow around of um, single round of DNA replication. And this um, basically assures chromosome number reduction and thus keeps somatic chloidy um, stable upon fusion of male and female gametes. And the most interesting parts for us in the context of breeding or for us in the context of research in the plant field is that meiosis also assures genetic variation. So this is typically based on the formation of so-called crossovers. And here, like you have depicted in the scheme, you have the total parental chromosomes depicted in blue and red, and you can see that actually based on crossover exchange, reciprocal DNA is exchange, and this basically assures new variation that is basically harnessed during the breeding process. So if you are now either from a um, research perspective or from a breeding perspective, you want to measure or you want to follow meiotic recombination. So usually how we do this, when you think about plants, you usually grow large segregating populations in the field, and then you perform either genotyping by sequencing or you do molecular marker analysis, and this is simply depending on a huge number of plants. The alternative, what we also use commonly, is to um, perform meiotic chromosome analysis, so this is rather low throughput and laborious because you need to analyze individual cells. So as depicted there on the right side, you can see either cytology, basically staining the chromosomes and based on the shape of the chromosomes, you can define where the crossover event took place or alternatively, you can use immunocytochemistry using antibodies that basically detect um, proteins involved in meiotic recombination. As alternative, which is a very interesting um, in, in the field of meiosis is to use so-called gamete sequencing or genotyping approaches. So in our case, in the plant field, gametes are the single haploid outcome, and this is either the X cells in plants or pollen nuclei. And basically what pollen nucleus genotyping would allow is that you could omit really growing large segregating population and like depicted in a scheme where you see a spike of barley, you could take the individual answers, you could isolate pollen, Pollen is depicted on the right, where you see a gelat, rigid structure, which contains three haploid nuclei, and one is the so-called vegetative, one is the sperm nuclei, and they are used for the double fertilization process in plants. So in principle, um, you can get large amounts of pollen from a single plant. There is no need of time-consuming laborious crossover detection, and you could immediately measure crossover frequency in hybrid pollen. But one limitation is these are individual haploid nuclei with a limited DNA content. 
So in, in the past already for Bali, single point nucleus genotyping was established. So the whole procedure was developed here at the IPK in the group of Andreas Huben. And the basic idea was we isolate from a single plant pollen grains. We optimize to crack these very rigid pollen walls. Then we have a pollen nuclei suspension. We use the flow cytometer. We sort individual pollen nuclei. And then due to the limited DNA content, we perform a whole genome amplification and subsequently either cast marker genotyping, for instance, or even single cell genome sequencing was performed. However, if you think for a breeding or research perspective, your sample that you can actually analyze is rather limited due to the VGA step. So we ask whether this expensive and rather low throughput VGA procedure could be maybe skipped. So what, what I would like to show you is to address whether a single haploid nucleus can be genotyped to measure meiotic recombination rates. And here was the first contact with Stila um, to test whether we could use their crystal digital PCR platform as a NICA system to really do this. And uh, the basic principle or the idea which we had in mind is depicted here in the scheme. So we use usually hybrid plants which have polymorphism between the cultivar. In our case, we use barley and we use cultivars Barky and Morix, which I will later on only term B and M. Then we isolate the pollen nuclei. We use a flow cytometer to isolate specifically PI stained haploid pollen nuclei, and then we load this into one of the four chambers of a so called sapphire chip from the Stiller system. We use the NACA Geo to perform encapsulation and a digital or crystal digital PCR genotyping, and then we use later on a scanner and analyze this in a crystal miner software. Why we decided for the system was that it actually uh, a rather simple procedure. So you can analyze up to 12 samples per um, crystal D PCR run. So you can run in the G with up to three chips. And per chips, you can have up to four chambers. And per chamber, in our experience, roughly 25,000 droplets are formed. Moreover, initially, we could detect with the prism three, three different colors. So in theory, this would allow high throughput meiotic recombination measurements. So the first experiment we did, we sorted individual haploid pollen nuclei, and then we performed encapsulation reaction. And uh, based on the PI stain of the pollen nuclei, we are actually able in the Stiller system in the reader to detect our individual nuclei. So this was one of the very first experiments we did quite some years ago, showing that you can actually nicely encapsulate this individual haploid nuclei within the droplets. So basically encapsulation of barley pollen nuclei is possible in the droplets. As the next thing, then we decided to define different chromosomal intervals between the hybrid, so using polymorphic marker and defining genetic intervals on different chromosomes, on different chromosomal locations, centromeric, distal region of the chromosomes that would allow us to measure the frequency of recombination events within these genetic intervals. <clears throat> So the procedure is depicted here, how we do this. We usually use for a genotype, which is Barker, so which is depicted here as B. We use um, a pro we use probe labeling in, let's say, in hex or in green, and we use for the Moritz genotype a probe, which is in FAM. So basically what you expect from a haploid um, meiotic outcome is either if you have a no recombinant a gamete, you would either expect BB or MM, so only hex fluorescent or fun fluorescent. And in case you would have a crossover or recombination event between the marker in this haploid nucleus, you would expect uh, B plus M or M plus B, meaning you would get a mixture of hex and fun. And here on the right side is then also one of the early experiments depicted where you can nicely really define after encapsulation of nuclei and performing on a haploid nucleus genotyping reaction that you can distinguish non-recombinant and recombinant pollen. So depicted in the green or in the blue box, you see the parental gamete outcome of meiosis, and in the middle you see the recombinant. Moreover, we see different population which reflect uh, droplets where we get only amplification from one of the loci, or where we have droplets where we have no nucleus encapsulated or the genotyping reaction failed. 
And um, to optimize the system, um, we performed in the beginning a lot of um, encapsulation experiment to test really um, how consistent and re reproducible we can encapsulate these haploid pollen nuclei. And we tested in a range of two to 6,000 nuclei. And what you can see is that basically there's a linear increase so that roughly half or 40% of the nuclei we sought in, we get actually successfully encapsulated, which matches more or less a poison prediction. And that we also, when we checked for a droplet that contained, for instance, two nuclei, um, that this number is also increasing with the number of um, sorted nuclei. However, this is much lower than expected to our surprise. And these doublets would usually co uh, potentially cause an error, because if you have by chance two nuclei of the opposite genotype encapsulated, you would genotype this wrongly as a uh, a recombinant nucleus, and in this case, this needs to be circumvented. So with this, I would like to conclude that you can consistently and reproducible and haploid haploid nuclei. And for all further analysis, we used typically 3,000 floor sorted nuclei as a benchmark to establish our platform. So as depicted on the left side, after we have isolated the nuclei via flow cytometer, the nucleus is still intact. So in the initial experiment, encapsulating roughly 1,400 nuclei on average, we got, um, without any treatment, we could genotype around 160 to 170 nucleus in a single chamber. If we did proteinase K treatment, we could slightly increase the genotyping efficiency. But if we use a so-called uh, thermostable restriction enzyme, so restriction enzyme that is also active during the um, DPCR conditions, we could actually dramatically increase the efficiency. So we could more than one, uh, nearly twofold or nearly two and a half fold increase the genotyping efficiency of individual nuclei. So this tells us that improved template accessibility can increase DPCR PCR-based um, pollen genotyping efficiency. And um, as a next thing, as I mentioned before, we were able to distinguish within the droplets, we can distinguish um, the encapsulation of droplets that contain no nucleus or even that contain more than a single nucleus. So what we did is actually, we defined also what we call false positive within the recombinant and non-recombinant fraction. So we basically discarded all the droplets that contain either none or more than a single nucleus. And this basically improved the efficiency. And this was also the beauty of the system that in the scanner, we can nicely see our nuclei even after thermocycling and scanning. As is another point, um, what we noticed despite discarding them, performing a certain control experiment, we, knew, we, we realized that we had a certain noise. So like approximately 1% of nuclei were wrongly genotyped. So we asked whether this could be, for instance, due to DNA contaminations during the, for instance, the flow sorting procedure. So what we performed, we performed a very simple experiment, performing a pollen nuclei suspension, but adding now fluorescent um, beads. And now we sorted with a flow cytometer specifically for resident beads. And the idea was very simple. If you have DNA contamination or DNA fragments, this DNA fragment should have a similar chance um, to be incorporated during the flow sorting, independent of nucleus or fluorescent beads. So when we encapsulated now this fluorescent calibration beads in the uh, crystal digital PCR, we could actually nicely see encapsulation of these beads, but we could see no amplification in any bead containing droplet. So with this, we could conclude that there was no DNA contamination in our system. And after having performed uh, various control experiments, we asked now whether we can also really use the system. So we measured in uh, these four chromosomal intervals from uh, um, uh, a number of plants, which I depicted in the black dots. We measured in a high number of pollen nuclei. We measured now the frequency of recombination in this. And uh, what you can see is depicted in the red dots is the average recombination frequency measured in pollen nuclei in these genetic intervals. We see that most intervals are fairly stable in terms of recombination. If you show more plant by plant variation, but overall the average recombination frequency um, reflects um, more or less recombination rates, which we observe in um, genetic maps, which were published for this hybrid. And to further confirm this, we also analyzed recombination rates in offspring population from the pollen measured plants which are depicted in the light blue bars. And you can nicely see that 
uh, recombination rates in segregating offspring population are similar to the rates that we measure in pollen. And to further confirm that the frequency which we really measure is, let's say, true, we, we used our offspring plants and basically used this to predefine the number of recombinant nuclei which we encapsulate. So how we did this, so if you have an offspring plant, we picked it offspring plants that were heteroallelic, so they showed on either the male or the female side a crossover event. So then the offspring plant would only produce pollen that are either parental or that are recombinant. And if we mix this now with our parental pollen nuclei in various defined ratio, we could clearly say, okay, in this sample, we have now 5% of recombinant pollen nuclei. In this sample, we have 10%, or in the other one, we have, for instance, 50%. And when we measured now in these predefined samples, our recombination measurements, we actually exactly measured this number. So showing again, the reliable measurement of recombination in haploid pollen nuclei based on um, crystal digital PCR-based genotyping. <clears throat> As the next thing, we also asked whether we can use our setup um, for a range of plant species. So we picked uh, various plant species and we isolated nuclei from these plants with very different nuclear and genome sizes. So we have a very small genome from our model plant Aridopsis thaliana up to Visia faba to beans, which differ in genome size nearly by a factor of 100 and accordingly also the nuclei. And when we did encapsulation experiment, similar to Bali, roughly 40% of the nuclei got successfully encapsulated. And similar as the observation which we had for Bali, also the number of droplets that contain more than a single nucleus were actually lower than expected. So this tells us that our system can be actually used for nuclei with different DNA and with different um, genome size. And uh, finally, I would like to show you a little bit how we continue. So what I showed you before was uh, always measuring from a single nucleus one genetic interval. But more recently, and also um, in collaboration with Stiller, we had already access earlier to the so-called PRISM6. So this is a reader update, which allows us now, instead of three colors, to actually genotype six colors. So in addition of FAM, HEX, and SCIFI, we could also measure now um, Sci 3, ROX, Sci 5, up to 700, and FAM and Yakima yellow. So basically, the system allows you to detect six colors in parallel in a droplet. And based on this, one of the early experiments was to use our um, genetic intervals to multiplex. And so we used one centromeric interval and one distal interval. We used um, probes for FAM, for ROX, for HEX, and for SCIFI. And this was basically one of the very first results which we run. And what, what is depicted here is basically that you can simultaneously measure meiotic recombination rates in two genetic intervals. Or you could also more simply say, you can uh, genotype in a droplet, in this case, four markers in parallel from a single haploid nucleus. And then that um, you can also further establish the system. So we went on, we used a different hybrid materials, more breeding materials, because we are interested to extend this also to further hybrids or to have further application. So here we use some novel genetic intervals and we did again um, multiplexing assays. So using here again, at least four different probes. And also if we establish this for new probes, the system works actually quite reliable. You have them both cases depicted haploid nuclei that are genotyped at different positions. And we can again nicely de define um, the frequency of recombinant versus non-recombinant gamete nuclei from a plant. So this tells us that the six color system allows you really to multiplex heavily. And with this, I would also like to summarize. So the crystal digital PCR machine allows us to um, genotype single pollen nuclei in Bali. I showed you today that we measured initially two centromeric and two distal intervals for more than 40,000 pollen nuclei each, that um, recombination rates and pollen nuclei um, measured via the crystal D PCR are similar to offspring. Uh, to recombination rates in offspring segregating population, that also the system is compatible with a huge range of nuclei with different size and genome contents from various plant species. They are compatible with crystal DPCR and that the new PRISM6 <clears throat> allows you really to multiplex various genetic intervals so you can dramatically increase your sample throughput. And with this,
I would already like to thank uh, various people without whom the work would be not possible. So I would specifically like to thank once again Jun Jehan and Zuria Muta, who have basically established and who are working on the system. I would like to thank Jörg Fuchs for all the flow cytometer help, Andreas Huben for um, helping for initially setting this up. I would like to thank specifically the people from Stellar Technologies for all their technical and application support. So in all issues what we had, they responded very fast. It was a very, very good um, collaboration to establish the system. And then I would like to sue uh, for sure various funding bodies uh, in my lab. And I would like to thank you for your attention. And in the case there are questions, I'm happy to take them. Many thanks.